All right, may, may I have your attention, please? So we're going to get started. So um, this session we, is called the Integrated Medicine and Wellness. Um, so it's really important to first uh, to sort of get a little bit understanding what that meant. Uh, as cancer, especially GI cancer, can cause a lot of the physical, emotional, and spiritual issues in individuals, and uh, so are the conventional cancer treatments such as chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. So individuals often have the de needs and desires that are not completely met by existing treatment modalities. It's really important in the care for you during cancer treatment and into survivorship, we're trying to incorporate as many as possible safe and effective treatments and some of this within the conventional, conventional psychosocial uh, system. Some are actually from uh, alternative and complementary disciplines. But the most important philosophy in integrative medicine is, is using the therapies in conjunction with conventional cancer treatments to support your health and wellness and ultimate, ultimately lead you towards a sense of healing and cure. So, so we are actually going to um, use this very diverse multidisciplinary panel to really discuss a patient. In the context of discuss this patient, you will get a little bit sense about the, the principles of integrative medicine. And really, these are services are currently available in the Abramson Cancer Center. So you can really utilize the resources we have here to provide you with health and well-being. So I'm going to introduce the panel, then we're going to start with the case. So I'm Jun Mao, I'm a physician, I'm also an acupuncturist. And next to me is Andrew Brennis, is our lead physical therapist. And Fernet Neibar Cohen is a certified yoga instructor, as well as a, a key personnel in our radiation uh, department. And Kim Fleischer is the lead coordinator for our cancer Reiki program. And Neil Nisnam is a social worker and also provides a psychosocial counseling. And Lauren, <laughs> could you say it? Jennifer. Sorry, Lauren Jennifer is our nutritionist and really experienced in cancer-related nutrition. And last but not least, Mara Wei uh, is really a, a very experienced mindfulness teacher and they really work with the Penn program for mindfulness. So we're going to start with this case. Um, the names uh, has been altered for uh, confidentiality. So this is uh, Mr. Jace. Uh, this is this is actually Miss Lynn Jones. She's a 64-year-old woman diagnosed with colorectal cancer. She had a resection of part of her right colon and had a course of chemotherapy. In a recent oncology visit, she was told by her oncologist that her cancer was cured and she just needed a regular periodic follow-up. She denies feeling uh, depressed, but sometimes she still finds herself crying for no reason. On one end, she feels lucky that her cancer is considered cured, but she continues to struggle with thoughts of recurrence, fear and uncertainty from time to time. Although she finished cancer treatment, she just does not feel like the old self. She has always been overweight in her life and has never been very physically active. However, after the cancer treatment, even months after her chemotherapy, she still feels extremely tired. And the physical exertion is excruciatingly exhausting. She also has tingling and numbness and pins and needles in her feet, which affects her balance and prevents her from participating in physical activities. She's interested in a healthy diet, but she, she's confused about what to eat, given all that she reads on the internet. So this is a patient that uh, it's not uncommon um, seen in our clinic. So I will talk a little bit about acupuncture and what acupuncture can be done for this patient. So acupuncture is a part of the large system healing called traditional Chinese medicine. In acupuncture, we use very thin stir needles and places at specific spots help to, to uh, theoretically to move the energy flow in the body in the Chinese medicine context. In the last 30 years, there have been a lot of research done in acupuncture show that acupuncture helps you bring release neurochemicals like endorphin, serotonin, those are neurohormones that help you to have a sense of happiness, calmness, as well as uh, deal with anxiety. 
In particular for uh, Ms. Jones, I think she has a neuropathy that seemed to be very painful and bothersome. So often in the clinical setting, I will uh, work with her for a number of sessions uh, to treat her painful neuropathy, as well as to work with her fatigue and help her uh, dealing with some of the anxiety and fear issues. And then after that, I'll send her to our wonderful colleague in physical therapy to really work on strengthening and functions. So, Andrea. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I'm a physical therapist. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, in the cancer center, in the Abramson Cancer Center. And what I would, um, seeing um, Mrs. Jones come to my um, clinic, I would be concerned with her physical activity. Um, we know a lot about physical activity and how it can help with some of the symptoms that people have as a result of cancer and its treatment. Um, exercise and physical activity can help really help to decrease cancer-related fatigue, help give energy back. It can help with mood. Um, it can help with uh, balance issues. It can help someone get back to their normal activities with their family. And um, it can even help to decrease recurrence. Um, we know that physical activity and exercise can um, help to modulate all of those things. Um, but we also know that physical activity can be very hard to get started. If you are a person who've had a, who's had a sedentary lifestyle, the idea of getting up and exercising, particularly when you have peripheral neuropathy or fatigue or you've gone through a difficult time, can be very, very hard, and we know that. So um, one of the things we try to do with people are, is start their activity very, um, in a very small manner. Maybe it's just parking the car a little bit further from the grocery store. Maybe it's taking the stairs one flight instead of the elevator. Um, maybe it's just walking around the house during commercials when you're watching TV. Those little steps can help people to become more active without becoming, feeling like they need to train for a marathon. So um, if we saw Ms. Jones in our clinic, we would very much want to start her on an exercise program. For some people, and this um, woman may be one of those, um, it helps to do a supervised exercise program where they meet with either a physical therapist or a, a trainer who's got specific um, education in working with patients who've had cancer to get a baseline and find out where is the best way for that person to start their exercise program. Not everybody is going to start their exercise program at the same place and we want to help do, um, develop that type of exercise program on an individualized level. So um, we'd like to see um, Ms. Jones start on an exercise program because we know that many of the symptoms she's feeling and the feelings that she's having following cancer can be helped with act an increase in activity and exercise. Um, we want to help her get back to um, get started on that exercise program as soon as possible. Hi, I'm Fern Neibauer Cohen, and we are very excited to say that we will be starting a yoga program at the Abramson Cancer Center for our patients and their caregivers within the next couple of months. So stay tuned for that. Um, we'll be working very closely with my co-teacher, Tali Ben-Joseph, who's in the audience. You can wave. She led the stretch earlier today in the pancreatic cancer lecture. So really looking forward to developing a program. So just to get a sense, anyone in this room ever practice yoga? Have any experience with yoga? Wonderful. So yoga is, is very popular uh, right now in, in our culture and really taking a very ancient um, approach to, to breathing, posture, movement, um, and bringing it in a very practical direction and is, is really beneficial in working with cancer patients. So in working with Ms. Jones in particular, what I would do um, for her anxiety and her feelings of being overwhelmed and stressed is really working with her um, in a seated position and working with breath work. So there are a number of different breathing techniques um, called pranayama that are very, very simple that she could carry into her activities of daily living. Um, some of them include like alternate nostril breathing that really clears the mind and provides focus and relieves anxiety as well as doing some other deep breathing, three-part breathing techniques. So there's a posture in yoga called tree pose, and I would not recommend doing that you know, full directly 
um, to begin with, but just starting, just standing with the assistance of a chair and just lifting her leg up, you know, in a very, very mindful, very micro movement and keeping her gaze very fixed and being tuned to her breath. So it's really connecting breath and movement um, in a very mindful direction that can then help her restore her balance and make her feel a little bit more confident in that direction. Um, using props such as a chair, you don't have to stand to do yoga. It doesn't have to be a 90 minute class in a gym. It's something that's very, very accessible and can be done you know, for just even a few minutes by doing some, some very, very small movements while sit using a chair or a prop or something to be supportive. So that's the direction I would go. Hi everyone, my name is Kim and I'm the Reiki practitioner. And um, I, I'm assuming that maybe some of you don't know a lot about Reiki, so I'll give you a little introduction. It's a really gentle practice that you can either learn to do for yourself, similar to meditation. It's, it's something you can do on a daily basis. It's also something you can receive in a, as a session or a treatment, similar to body work. Um, I met some of you might have experienced it at the Cancer Center. We have a program for patients in inpatient, in outpatient chemotherapy and other infusions and in radiation oncology. You can get it during or before or after your treatments your conventional treatment, and it's facilitated by really gentle touch. So if, you're, if you learn how to treat yourself, you're, you're gently touching yourself for several minutes in different areas of the body, and if you receive a treatment, the practitioner's gonna make sure that they touch you in places that you're comfortable, only comfortable with, and they'll leave their hands there or hover slightly above for several minutes at a time. And, Similar to yoga and meditation, which and mindful, mindfulness, mindfulness meditation, which you'll hear a little bit about, these practices really give us a space to come home to ourselves. So this, this um, patient really talks about this idea of after the treatments and after everything she's been through and now as a survivor, she doesn't feel like herself. And one of the most commonly reported benefits I hear from patients is that Reiki practice helps them feel like themselves again that it's somehow the space that's provided by the touch and the opportunity to restore and to take time and to breathe and to be with yourself and to connect that space between your mind and all the thoughts that you're having and what you're actually feeling in your body is so nourishing. And it seems like an, on the one hand it's a Japanese practice and it seems like it could be woo woo, like how can someone just putting their hands on me have an effect? But then when we think about this idea of wellness and this idea of space and rest and coming back to ourselves, that the touch that's provided and facilitated through the practice seems to give a lot of patients a lot of space to balance. So it promotes balance, it promotes wellness. A lot of people report localized pain relief in the places that the practitioner's touching and real decreases in anxiety, um, agitation, stress and increases in, in energy and res restoration. Um, so I also heard a little bit about her uh, lack of motivation to want to exercise, even though there's, um, she knows that it might be good for her. And a lot of times when we come back to ourselves and we feel more balanced, um, there's a little bit more space for motivation to do things that we are interested in. So I think in general, Reiki practice, it doesn't ever treat specific symptoms. It treats the whole person. And then as a side effect of coming back to yourself and getting more balanced, um, symptoms tend to be restored or fall away. So thank you. My name is Neil, and as a social worker and psychotherapist, I'd like to come at this particular situation from a psychological perspective. Um, I, I see two issues going on for Linda. Um, one is, um, even though she's been given the, uh, the cure word from her oncologist, she's finding that she's become more worried and also very tearful. And that seems to be inconsistent with where maybe others think that she should be at that particular point post-treatment. And she's also looking for her old self. She wants to regain that sense of normalcy that she had prior to even being diagnosed. Um, I kind of call this the post-treatment effect. 
And what she's dealing with is the emotionality of everything that she's gone through from diagnosis through treatment and now coming out of treatment where she had to really kind of compartmentalize, I think, her feelings just to go through everything she had to go through, to get through surgery, to get through chemotherapy, to maybe even continue to manage areas of her life like her family, possibly work, and other things. She did that very well, except that now she's playing emotional catch up. And I think she's getting maybe a negative message possibly from her family and friends because they're ecstatic now that you have been cured, you've gone through this horrific situation in your life, so now you should be happy, move on with your life and, and you know, stop crying and stop worrying. And Well, it's inconsistent with what she's really feeling. She's feeling scared, she's worried. She finds that she's periodically tearing up. And so the support from family is not gonna be consistent with what she really needs. She's trying to wrestle with this herself as well. And you can see from the, um, the vignette that Dr. Mao had talked about, it's not that she's being shut down by this exp um, the, the feelings of fearfulness or the feelings of tearfulness. Um, she's actually able to manage them. She experiences this sometimes or now and then. But she's able to manage things on a day-to-day -day basis. Possibly throughout her whole treatment experience, she didn't have an opportunity to look at what was going on emotionally. Uh, there's a psychological term for that, which is compartmentalization. She kind of put all the feelings on hold in order to focus on getting through the day-to-day. -day. But I think now is the time post-treatment for her to look at and examine those feelings. And this is where a psychotherapy counseling would really benefit her. Um, it's been noted in the literature, the psycho-oncology literature, that for a lot of patients, one to three months post-treatment, they all of a sudden hit this wall, either with increased anxiety or depression, even if all the way through treatment they've been doing very, very well. And possibly what was going on is the fact that you know, she was taking all of her feelings and just putting it on hold, but now that she has the opportunity to start to look at them, it's almost like grief work. The grief of the losses that she's incurred throughout treatment, whether the physical losses or other things that she's had to give up, specifically the loss of her identity and self, is now bubbling up to where she has to wrestle with it. Um, the worry could come from a sense of being vulnerable. A lot of patients talk about, after treatment, feeling more vulnerable for recurrence because now they're no longer on active treatment. And the fearful, the tears, are really just an expression of her emotion. Sometimes tears don't have to always connote sadness. They could just be uh, an ambiguous sense of just feelings that are coming out and they come out in the form of tears. So for her to hook up with a therapist and begin to talk about this whole cancer experience is going to enable her to first of all emote, get in touch with those feelings in a more controlled way. Also to examine what are the losses that she has incurred but more importantly, try to integrate this sense of the cancer experience into her life now so that she can get a better sense of who she has become post-cancer experience. It's really what she's doing is beginning to develop a new sense of self. Will it be the same self she had prior to diagnosis? Probably not. But there are parts of her that she can reconnect with and develop a new sense of who she is and a sense of meaning in her life. Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I actually work over at Penn Presbyterian and I just joined the Abramson Cancer Center this year, so I'm pretty new as far as oncology and nutrition, but I've met a lot of great people and I'm still learning. Um, as far as Mrs. Jones go, I know there's a lot of misconceptions about nutrition and cancer and you know certain diets that are out there and um, you know other herbal remedies. I would probably just stick to um, the basics of nutrition to start off and that would just be you know endorsing whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables and lean meats especially for someone like Mrs. Jones who has been overweight her whole life. She's feeling lethargic and down. Um, increasing fruits and vegetables is a great way to kind of boost your energy level. Um, this is where all the antioxidants are found and you know they've been shown to have a um, you know kind of a, a soothing effect for the body. They kind of quench 
these free radicals that can do damage to your tissues. So fruits and vegetables are always where I like to start with people. As far as the um, other remedies, like you know, drinking teas and things like that, the research has kind of been inconclusive as to whether or not their, um, you know, their cancer preventative measures are actually working. But I usually tell people that if it makes you feel better, you know, teas aren't going to harm you. You just have to know the effects. Um, it's something, you know, if you're going to try these, to discuss with your doctor first and make sure that they're safe. There's no side effects. So. I would definitely just go back to general nutrition, you know, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, lean meats, and um, start there with Mrs. Jones. It can be really confusing, the nutrition aspect of this, so I always just go back to the basics first. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Mara Way, and I work for the Penn Program for Mindfulness, which is a meditation program at Penn was started by a physician about 20 years ago. And uh, like Kim said, a lot of people think it's woo-woo, <laughs> but it's actually not woo-woo. And in this day and age, actually in the past couple years, more and more and more and more people are turning towards things like meditation to help them to cope with just difficulties of life these days. You know, we live in a pretty stressful world. And you know, people every day are juggling with work-life balance and, and things like that just to get through their day-to-day -day lives. And then on top of that, if you throw in a cancer diagnosis or symptoms that many of you are experiencing or the psychosocial symptoms that come along with something like this, it can be really difficult and it can actually, you know, throw you out of your center. So mindfulness is a tool to help people to, and it's, in a real nutshell, mindfulness is a tool to help people to train their attention and to learn how to be present in exactly what is happening right now, regardless of the situation. So we teach people how to use mindfulness to manage stress, and we teach it as an eight-week program. And it does require practice. It's something that uh, you know, requires people to practice every day, and there's a certain amount of time it actually takes to develop this skill very much like exercise, you know, it takes practice and a commitment to do it. And we actually thought that we would do a practice right now um, to give you a taste of that. Is, is that something that you'd want to try? Okay, because it, it would require just, you know, putting down the fork for a second. <laughs> I know it's going to be a little bit difficult because there's this tease of a, a plate of food right in front of you. But I'm going to just ask, just for, we'll just do it for a minute. Um, so. If you can put down your fork and um, sit for a moment, we'll just do it for 60 seconds, okay? And I'll guide you through a 60 second practice, okay? So as you inhale, actually feel the breath filling all the way into the body. And then as you exhale, feel the release. And then you might notice that your attention wanders, there's other sounds and feelings going on in the room, but just Gently guide your attention to this breath that's happening right now. Okay, place your attention on the breath. This is what's happening right now. You're breathing, we're sitting here. And for the next breath, see if you could bring all of your attention to the breath. Really noticing it, fill into the body. And then noticing the release of breath on the exhalation. And then we'll do that again, but this time gather even more attention, just noticing the breath as closely as possible as it enters in. And then as you release, feeling completely what's happening. Okay, and then you can open your eyes. So just a little taste of what that's like. You know, so maybe some of you in just of that 60 second period of time notice there, there might be a different feeling in your body right now. Maybe there's just more awareness. So mindfulness is a tool to help you to bring all of your attention into the present moment and to begin to manage what is actually happening. There's a lot of empirical research now that shows that mindfulness actually benefits um, 
people in, in reducing depression and anxiety. It helps people to manage and reduce fatigue, um, as well as other things. And it helps people to actually begin to take charge of their life and begin to think about what the ne next step would be. So in Mrs. Jones's case, where there was a lot of confusion and uncertainty and fear about what might happen next, mindfulness can be a really useful tool to help people to really begin to gather themselves and, and feel more grounded in, in life on a daily basis. So, thank you for your attention. Great, thank, thank you for the panel, for the expertise. So we, we are going to have some time for questions. We never planned to have mindfulness competing with lunch. So that was an unplanned, but in life there's often unplanned, right? Like nobody planned cancer, but cancer is in our lives. So I think that the part of the, the, the art of um, this session is really to know that there are different type of uh, traditions and therapies and modalities. If you have needs, you really need to let your doctors know, and you need to really let your nurses know, and you really need to let your social workers know. So we're all here to really help to support you during treatment and beyond treatment.